let's get started. This is the judge psychology mind of the judge elected. That's not where you're supposed to be. You can get up and go. I won't judge you. Uh, okay, so why are we here and why should you care about this? Um, it's going to seem trite to say, but you're debating, every debate you're going to have is going to be in front of a judge. And that judge is going to decide who won the debate. And debating in the abstract is very different from debating in front of a person who has biases and ideas and is tired and annoyed. And so you have to play to that person, not to the arguments in the abstract. This is also important because many of you will be judged by judges multiple times, uh, the same judges in multiple debates over time. And you can leave lasting impressions on judges that influence how they interact and judge you in future debates. And that is a sort of underrated skill, I would say, for having a successful debate career long term. So how should you think about the role of the judge uh, in a debate? The like trite version of this is, have any of you seen The Great Debaters, the movie with Denzel Washington? There's like a scene in the movie where he has his team, it's like a basically a sports movie about debate, Denzel Washington's a coach of an all-black debate team in the 1930s, it's a pretty good movie, you should watch it. There's a... It's like, who's the judge? Yeah. Who is the judge, and what does the debater say? The judge is God. The judge is God. Why is he God? Why is he God? Because he, just, he decides who wins or who's not my opponent. Not my opponent? Who is your opponent? He is nobody, no one? He doesn't exist. Oh, he doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, so your opponent doesn't exist. The person you are trying to convince is the judge. As the last line of that refrain goes, why does he not exist, my opponent? Because he is merely a dissenting voice to the truth I speak. I knew that one. <laughs> yeah, that's the one, that's the best one. Um, the judge is God. So take it, take it down a notch. Uh, the judge is an active participant in the debate. And this is maybe the key thing I want to impart. The judge is not a robot sitting there in the back of the room listening to you and then objectively deciding. Judges have predispositions and feelings and emotions and are actively participating in everything you're saying even when it doesn't seem like they are. And again, this may be obvious to you in some cases, but I want to make some of these things explicit so you have a sort of framework for understanding how to play to and debate for a judge that is a person and a participant, not an objective observer. The next sort of like intro principle here is that as a result of this, the processes that govern judges' decisions are very, very different from the processes that govern how debaters make arguments. So the way you are thinking about your arguments and your interaction between your arguments and your opponent's arguments is not the same way that the judge is thinking about those things. So understanding how a judge interprets your arguments relative to your opponent's is a process of coming outside yourself. Right? It's a process of thinking about your arguments and your opponent's arguments in a way that is detached from how you would normally invest in your arguments. So I'm going to group the sort of like principles here that I want to get through in the next 45 minutes into the sort of like basic ideas of how to, how to debate to a judge and not just like a robot. That's the sort of top level, probably most important. We're going to do a section on like how to interact with the judge outside of a speech just sort of like ideas about how to like be a person that the judge wants to vote for, and then how to sort of debate in front of the judge multiple times, right? If, you have, if you're judged by somebody at like different tournaments over the course of the year, what does, how does that sort of like shape your debate? So basic ideas about like debating to a judge and not a robot, I think the most important, and this is something that you will hear in basically every lecture or every discussion about debate or RFD that you get, is acknowledging your opponent's arguments. So what I mean by this is that the principle I'm trying to communicate here about judging is that judging judges often want to think that both teams are right. And this is maybe one key distinction between how debaters think about their arguments and how judges judge debates. You want to defeat your opponent's arguments, presumably, or else you wouldn't be here, I assume. Maybe you're here for the education, that's also fine. Um, Judges are not thinking about arguments defeating other arguments. They are thinking about resolving other arguments. Right? Debaters are thinking in terms of conflict. Judges are thinking in terms of resolution. The implication of this is that very few debates are ever decided because one team has one, zero, or 100% risk of their arguments. 
right? It is never the case that one team is entirely right and the other team is entirely wrong. When the debate ends, the process of judging involves figuring out who has won more of their arguments, not just who has won their arguments. This is probably a good place, but a question I should have asked at the beginning is, how many of you all have judged a debate, like a novice or a JV debate? Oh, okay, that's great. Okay, so you all probably have some intuitive sense of this, but like, how many of you have judged more than five debates? More than 10? Okay, all right, so we're getting there. Um, but a lot of you that have judged debates have not judged that many is probably correct, correct to say, right? Okay, so this is a set of ideas that will develop for you over the course of judging um, that may be intuitive to you at the moment, but not entirely obvious. So acknowledging your opponent's arguments is probably something that like, you, it, if you're judging debates, you will realize it is easier to decide a debate when one team says, even if the other team is right, we still win because. Right, you probably, this is the, the thing that you all have probably already heard in many ways, right? Even if statements. The reason those are important is because you want to give the judge the ability to say, the other team was right, but we still, or you still win because. Right, the other team has won some component of their argument. They may be right that the plan causes an increase in interest rates, right? Causes the Fed to hike interest rates. But we still win because the reason we solve the economy is more important. Right, solving inequality is more important than avoiding interest rate hikes. That kind of even if statement is what allows judges to resolve conflicts between arguments and still decide that one team is ahead of the other. So acknowledging your opponent's arguments is a critical component of this. If you have questions at any point, just like oh, I'm sort of talking at you, but like chime in at any point. Emphasizing important arguments is the other component of this, or another component of this. Judges are timely. I have spent a decade judging debates and debating, and I can tell you that the adrenaline you get when debating does not show up when judging. <laughs> Judges are tired, almost always. Nobody can process every word of a two to 300 word per minute speech. Nobody can process every word of a conversational speech. speech. Judges are not transcribing your speech, or absorbing every word of it, or staying engaged for the whole eight minutes of speech. They are zoning out, they are trying to flow, they're doing their best. So even if both teams' arguments are of equal quality and of equal importance, two exactly equal teams, if you can distinguish which arguments of yours are most important, and why they're more important than your opponents, you will win, because the judge will know that they need to care about your arguments more than they need to care about your opponent's arguments. Independent of argument quality or argument quantity. This occurs both on the macro and the micro level. So the macro level involves structuring your speech, especially in the final rebuttals, to, to actually emphasize these arguments, right? Like starting with the impact that you think you're winning the debate, starting with that first in, in the 2NR or the 2AR, right? Um, starting, you know, going for the argument on, you know, on flow, like going for a disad answer that you think is more important, doing that first and spending more time there. Um, you can even literally say, this is important. You can tell the judge, this is important. Listen to me now, right? Judges are fine with that because they want to be told what to listen to and what they can drift off during. The micro level is, at the, at the level of speaking, it is the worst thing you can do is be monotone in this regard. So varying your volume and tone, getting louder or, and slower on the words and the phrases that the judge should write down is partly just implicitly, judges are just, you know, if I'm judging a debate, I'm just gonna be able to hear you more if you're louder and you're slower. But it also actively signals what arguments you think are important. That means even on the text of cards, when you're reading a piece of evidence, all the highlighting, not being monotone on that, having emphasis, having parts that are bolded so you slow down and get slightly louder, but especially during important parts of your speeches, especially the last few rebuttals, having moments where you're making eye contact, getting louder, getting slower, to communicate to the judge what you think is important about your argument. Flowing is an art of note-taking and not transcribing, right? The judge is probably flowing you. They might not be. Some judges don't, most do. If they are, they are not transcribing your speech, as I said before, right? They are, no, they are writing functionally reminders to themselves about your arguments. 
And so judges need to know what's important to remind themselves of that. Judges are not reading off a transcript when they judge a debate. Right? The debate's over. The judge is trying to resolve the debate. They are not reading the debate back to themselves on their flow. They are using the flow to remind themselves what both teams said. So if you can, if they can already remember what you said more clearly and with greater emphasis, that will be foremost in their mind when they start sort of forming their decision. This is related to the next sort of bullet point here, which is tell the judge what to do. And this is again another thing where you probably have heard this before, but I'm trying to sort of make it explicit for like why this is important from the perspective of, of judges' psychologies. Judges are tired. They don't want to resolve the debate from scratch. This is why impact calc is important, right? Like impact calculus where you say our impact is bigger or it's faster or it's more likely. That tells the judge what they should care about first. And I say first for a very particular reason, which is that judging is a chronological process. Judges start their decision, the process of making the decision, they start by resolving the most important arguments first and then figuring out how everything else fits into those most important arguments that they've already resolved. I have heard it said that judges spend the first five minutes of the decision figuring out who won the debate and the rest of the decision justifying. This isn't always true, and it's a sort of a general principle, but it is more true than you realize that the first couple of arguments that judges think about determine who wins the debate. And everything else is just paperwork. Last thing about debating to a judge in this way is watching them during the debate. Some judges are more expressive than others. Some will communicate when they're sort of buying an argument, and others will not. Um, I'm a fairly expressive judge. I don't know if I'm a judge, any of you, I have not judged a lot of high school debates with me, but if I have, you will have noticed I, like, I will involuntarily make expressions or movements that indicate when I'm like, not understanding something. And this is true of a lot of judges. Right, being aware of if your judge is like confused or nodding or something like that, it, it, it are active tells that they are understanding or not understanding your argument. Um, just because you think you have communicated an argument well does not mean the judge has received that argument effectively. And you need to know when there is a breakdown in communication between you and the judge. Because that is the primary reason that debaters feel like they may have won a debate and the judge like goes to the other team. However good your argument is, if there's a breakdown in communication between you and the judge, that means you will not win the debate, or not win the debate on that argument. And you can usually tell when that's happening, if you are conscious and watching the judge. Uh, that means trying to watch the judge during your own speech as much as possible, right? Not just like speaking into your computer for eight minutes, but like being able to, to be able to see and make eye contact and view the judge while you're talking. Especially when your partner is speaking, right? This has been one of the most useful things you can do when your partner is talking is having a, a closer eye on the judge to see, like, uh, are they getting what they're saying or not? Does, does my partner need to slow down on something or, or something along those lines? And watch the judge when the other team is speaking. This is maybe even more, this is even easier, right? Because like you're not actually giving a speech, you're flowing or doing or playing Tetris. But you can figure out what of your opponent's arguments the judge is understanding and what they are. And that allows you to structure your arguments accordingly, right? It allows you to know what are the things I need to like answer comprehensively and what are the things that the judge just like didn't understand so I can kind of ignore, right? Is this making sense to folks? So these are my first set of things about just like debating in the context of a judge. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay, so that's like during your speeches. What about when you're not? Right, a debate is about two hours long. In high school, only about 64 minutes of that involves a speech or cross-ex. So a little less, or almost half of the debate, there is no speaking going on, right? From start time to when the judge renders a decision, there's a whole bunch of time when nobody is talking. Judges vote for the team that they want to win the debate. This is like unavoidably true, even if they know it or not, right? Judges decide at least subconsciously, in part because they want one team or another to win the debate. That is an assessment that begins the moment you walk into the room. Now, if both teams are doing this well, if both teams are acting like adults and being professional and stuff, they may not have a preference of who they want to win the debate, right? It's totally possible that the actual arguments will decide the debate, and indeed, they most often do. But if 
you are comporting yourself in a way that is unprofessional, which I'm sure none of you would do, that will influence how the judge reads and understands and evaluates your opinion. So over the course of those two hours, the judge is forming a holistic impression of you. At the very, at the very basic level, that means making eye contact, it means smiling when it's appropriate, it means treating them like a human being. Uh, reading, just sort of reading into a computer or a flow is unclear, but even if you are clear when you're doing that, you are not acknowledging the judge's presence, and that will make the judge not, make them less receptive to your argument. So, a po some components of this are, judges will put in as much effort as you put in, right? If you act like you don't want to be there, the judge will not want to be there either. And again, this is, this is not, my guess is that none of you really have this problem. Like, my guess is that all of you are going to debates like enthusiastic and excited to be there. But it happens, right? You're tired, you've lost, maybe you've lost your previous debate in a frustrating way. Um, maybe you're at, like you, you, you're not gonna clear the tournament, so you're frustrated and you like, don't really feel like it's important, and so you act like you don't wanna be there. The judge will see that and also not want to be there. Um, if you're funny, or if you're not funny, don't try to be funny. This is like a sort of a sidebar, but it's important. Like, what's that? You're fine. I am not a funny person. As a debater, I was never able to like make jokes and sort of like be the comedian in the room. So I didn't try. And that's fine. If you are funny, you can do, you can do that, right? You can execute the, the comedy routine, and that's good. And that makes that you know that'll make the judge laugh and make them like you. But the worst thing you can do is try to do that and fail. So when in doubt, take yourself seriously and be serious. Um, similarly, be friendly, but not too friendly. This is again sort of a happy medium where. If you don't know the judge personally, don't act like you do. Um, I promise it's weird. I promise it is off-putting if you sort of act like you know the judge. Now, that doesn't mean you like if you want to introduce yourself or say hi or whatever, shake their hand if you're in one of those circuits that does that. Um, that is fine. But acting like you're their friend when you're not is a little bit tends to be a little bit discordant. Um, Avoid, this is, this is part of this I think is probably gonna come in, if, you go, if you're going to, I think it's Ethan's Don't Be Cringe lecture, or Michaela's like practical debate knowledge lecture, this is all the same stuff, but I'm gonna say it now, because uh, it's important, which is like all this stuff is the same kind of thing, which is like don't look like a noob or be cringe. Um, avoid the like inside jokes, avoid the references to the, the debates the judge has been in, right? If you're being judged by a college debater that you like know a debate that they've been in, like don't make a reference to it. There's a way to sort of act like the judge is a person without acting like you know them personally and like are aware of their life story. Um, use their first name if you want, um, but I would not overuse it. So this is another thing where like, you definitely don't wanna say, like don't call the judge judge. This is something that I, that like every judge I've ever talked to, every person I've ever talked to hates being called judge when they are judging a debate. Um, you can call them by different name if you want, when it's, when it's required, yes. Do you not like being called judge? I don't like being called judge. Why not? Um, I don't know. It's hard to explain, it's genuinely hard to explain, but like every single person I've ever talked to, if they are called judge by the debaters, they're like, oh. It's just a psychological thing? It's a psychological thing where it, I don't want to say it, it's not like a process, it's not like, it doesn't like objectify the judge, that would be putting it too strongly, but um, it, it would be like calling me your own. You know, like it's a, it's a little too much. Like OD. Okay. What's up? I said like OD, like OD with OD word. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And again, it's, it is hard to explain, these are these sort of psychological things that like, you, it only comes after judging a bunch of debates that you kind of realize. Um, so that's why I'm trying to like make these things explicit, even if I don't have a great reason for them or whatever. Um, so when possible, first names are fine. Um, if it's an older, you know, like let's say you have a, like a local circuit where you're judged by like a teacher, you can like call them by like Mr. or Ms. whatever, like, you know, if you know that's what you need to do, you should do that. But yeah. avoid judge or your honor or anything like that, I would say. Um, some, are more, some, judges and other ju some judges are more chatty than others. Um, so like, are they gonna talk to you during the dead time? Or if like the other team goes to the bathroom and the judge, is the judge gonna like make conversation with you? This is different. Different judges are, are different like this. 
so this is a this is a matter of just like kind of reading them to see how much they're going to be like this. Um, if they don't want to make conversation, like don't try. Um, I I'm a fairly like if I ever judge any of you, I'm like a fairly like we'll probably have one exchange of some sort during the day time. Like I'll make a comment or someone will say something, I'll laugh, whatever. Like I'm a fairly expressive sort of chatty person in debates. Other people are like complete blank slates, like complete grip walls. Um, so part of this is just like knowing knowing that, figuring like reading the judge and figuring it out. Um, so don't try to break through that brick wall with the thing. Just kind of let it be. Um, this is a subtle point, but another thing that I think um, is is like calling a judge judge. It like sort of I don't have a great great reason for it, but the judge is you, and the other team is they. Right. You are speaking to the judge. The other team is a distraction, right? They are a dissenting voice to the truth I speak. Um, but again, even if you take it down a knot from that, you are talking to the judge and persuading them of your arguments and not your opponent's arguments. So this means avoiding phrases like, you dropped the disad. If, if the other team dropped the disad, they're in trouble. But it's not you dropped the disad, it's they dropped the disad. Right? And so this is a part of realizing that the person you are communicating with is the judge and not the other team. Yep. So does this apply to like cross as well? If you're like cross examination? Yes. So this is maybe something that how many of you all started your debating on Zoom? Oof. I'm sorry to you all. Um, hopefully this is a better experience than that. One thing that is not obvious on Zoom debate is that during cross acts you should be facing the judge. Right? So like if you're the other team, so I'm AF and they're NEG, and like you're the judge, I am not processing you like this. I'm processing like this. So I'm asking questions, but I'm facing the judge. Over here? No, it was kind of similar to that because some some girl, she was facing the judge the whole time while she was talking to me. But that was like, because the judge didn't like that. So I was kind of confused when you said that. Can you elaborate why? Why the judge didn't like the no, like opponent one, why facing better them. to face the judge while asking questions instead of your opponent that which the question directed to about the case? Because you're communicating with the judge. Okay. The goal of cross sex or speech is not to communicate with the other team. Okay. It is to communicate with the judge. Right. Now again, if you're if you know your judge doesn't like that, that's another matter. But in any like large scale, like even semi national circuit policy debate, your the expectation and the best practice is to face the judge. During process, especially. So, when you say you just face the judge during cross-ex, do you think it's like overwhelming for the judge if you just like like make direct eye contact with like the entire time, or do you just like? Look at the there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of like <laughs> it's like not the best move, right? Like again, if there's a human being involved here, you don't want to like skeeze them out. Um, but yeah, I don't I I. I it's not a problem to like be making eye contact. The judge is not going to be making eye contact with you the entire time. Right? They're going to be looking at their computer. They're going to be writing. They're going to look at the phone. Whatever. Like, you you probably be able to look at them and not feel like giving the death stare for three minutes. And look, if you need to like glance at your opponent or something, that's fine. Like, I'm not saying you could. You know, your head can be on a swivel. So the like thing a casual you casual side eye is okay. Casual side eye is great. Um, that's that's part. I mean. So sidebar on that, you can also be expressive without saying it, right? Like you don't have to say something to like, you know, give the look to communicate that you don't think an argument is credible. Like that is useful to the judge as well, right? So those kinds of nonverbal cues are useful. Um, when I say face the judge, what I really mean is like you should be looking at them, but like really what I mean is like, if I'm debating against you, if I'm talking to the judge, I should not be standing like this, right? I should be standing like this. And like you can, I can look over or whatever, but fundamentally I'm, Facing the judge. All right. Um, make the judge's life easy uh, on every other component of other sort of like non speech related stuff. So, judges want to judge efficient and put together debates, right? We don't want to be stuck in a room for two hours, people who like are a total mess. This is a significant component of the like ongoing impression that the judge. Is forming up you. So really, what this means is like, come prepared with pens, timers, paper, your laptop, have a laptop charger. You know, be efficient with the paperless stuff, right? Email chain. If you spend twenty minutes figuring out how to set up an email chain, 
you're like starting from a C, right? So be prepared for that kind of thing. Be practice. Have your sort of routine set up effectively. That will make the judge's life much easier and make them want to vote for you. I don't think there's anything super complicated there. Or anything like that that you all like still struggle with, like email chains, that kind of thing? Oh, no, you said anyone who's still struggle with email chains. Okay, practice. <laughs> I try. Cool. You know, I mean, it's also like, you'll get better. But, but a lot of this efficiency stuff is really, like this is a significant component of the way the judge is forming in a person. Um, it's like, are you, be, are you being efficient? Are you starting on time? Are you arriving to the room ahead of time? Are you taking bathroom breaks every two minutes? Like, being efficient with your debating and your behavior in the room is important. The last thing I have about this sort of like non-speaking stuff is that the judge doesn't care about you. And I don't mean this in a like negative way. Like the judge is not actively disliking you. You hurt my feelings. What's up? You hurt my feelings. I'm sorry. Um, what I really mean by this is some debaters come away from a debate being like, oh, that judge just hates me. Like, oh, that judge just hated our arguments. Um, I see some nods over there. That is almost never true. I say almost because maybe it is sometimes true. Like, I don't want to rule out the edge cases, the exceptions here. But in general, judges are tired. They can be cranky. They are people. So if they do not seem receptive to your argument, or if they seem frustrated during the debate, maybe you need to make your argument better. But it is almost never because of you as a person. And if you are judged by the same judge again, like later in the tournament or at the next tournament, you should not walk into the debate acting as if you're starting from a disadvantage because you like got judged by this judge previously and they were frustrated with you for some reason. Right? It is almost never going to carry over in that way. Um, judges are not trying to like make nemeses out of high school debaters. I promise. Um, this also means that judges, by and large, are like not really they don't care about high school debate drama, right? If there's like drama or like interpersonal stuff, it's almost always the judge like doesn't know. Again, there are exceptions to that, especially if they're younger, um, but generally not. All right, that's like intangible outside of speech stuff. Does that make any sense? Questions? How about this question? Um, we have half an hour, and I think we should be able to get through most of this. Those of you who started on Zoom, is there something different about in-person debate that has been like jarring or weird for you, as opposed to Zoom debate? Like how have you felt that transition? When, so like, first question is like, when was that transition? Like when was your first in-person transition? Well, for me, I think my first time in-person, and okay. like, I spent the next like year and a half on Zoom. Okay, so and you then, started like 2020? Uh, no, I started in 2022. Oh, okay, okay. And so, it was, we compete mostly nationally, and so everything was virtual until January of this year. Okay. Um, and so, what I noticed was I was a lot more anxious on in Zoom tournaments. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but okay. there's just something about the difference in, in like the environment that just makes it a lot harder to like compete and to just because you're not like with the people, you don't really know who you're interacting with. You don't have time to settle into a like room. You just kind of go and you just start, and it's really abrupt when you. Yes. Where were you debating from home or from your school? We were debating from school. Um, I think one thing, this is more like something that is in Zoom debate a lot, but wasn't, is people still have so much prep. Oh, so for sure. Yeah, so I, 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 that makes total sense. Um, um, people are just prepping yeah. constantly. The norms, I'm sure, totally broke down. Yeah, it was like my first time at in-person camp was when I went to Mitch 7 week last year, and our lab leaders were so frustrated because some of the kids didn't even know that it was stealing prep. Yeah, so this is a lot of stuff where, like, if you start on Zoom, we don't even realize some of this stuff, right? Like. What's stealing prep? Can someone define stealing prep for me? You like take, you like taking extra prep time when oh you can go yeah, yeah extra yeah, prep yeah. time the timer is not running when the timer isn't time. running right when when you're not actually taking prep but you're still typing or even like thinking or something like that right like that seems very easy on Zoom um, I was had judged some Zoom debates and I just like didn't even try to care about it because I just it was obviously going to happen all the time and like at a certain point who cares um, but it is frustrating so that's that's. Some of this stuff, like you're going to be able to be in the room in a more physical way. You're going to have prep time be timed in a way where your judge is like, I promise you, if you're stealing prep in person, I know about it. Like the judge knows. And like oftentimes you're not going to make an issue of it, but like it is very obvious 
when you were stealing Brad's work. I promise. So some of these things are, you know, one of the one of the aspects of the transition to in-person debate from Zoom or into Zoom and then back out of it if you started in person is the fact that the judge is sitting right there. Right? There's a person in the room with you that can see what you're doing at all times and is forming an impression of you in a much more direct way, way than they were able to on Zoom. Uh, yeah, and going off of that, I just think Thursday is a lot more important in person because, you know, you're hearing thousands of competitors during the three hour online. But That's fine. That's cool. Um, but generally, just like that. Yeah. What's ethos? Someone define ethos for me? Like, what's a word that comes to mind when I say ethos? Credibility. Credibility is another one that I'm thinking of. Persuasion. Persuasion. Presence. Presence is really what I'm thinking of, right? So ethos. Either, yeah, right. so logos, pathos, ethos, logos is like the logic of your argument, pathos is like your emotional appeal, ethos is sort of your, your presence, your persuasion. Um, judges are persuaded by people who have presence, who carry themselves with confidence, who reflect uh, a desire to be there, and confidence in their arguments, and um, a willingness to sort of engage in the debate in a creative That makes sense, and that's so much harder to see on Zoom, right? Like that is just impossible for a judge to evaluate in a little Zoom window, but it's like everything in person. Cool. So the, those are the two sort of first sections on speeches, like arguing in front of a judge, being in a debate in front of a judge when you're not speaking. The next section I want to talk about is debating in front of a, the same judge multiple times, right? So this is a lot of a lot of your situations, especially if you debate like in a local circuit. Um, maybe like alongside a national circuit or something like that, you're going to have judges who are sort of in your local circuit judging you all the time. Um, this was at least true for me. And so, like, what does, how should this change how you inter interact with this person, right? You should be taking notes when they talk. This is maybe you know this already, but you should be writing down what they say when they deliver their decision. How many of you do this? Okay. I'm assuming this is it. But if you're not doing it, you should do it. You should write down what they say to the other team as well. Right, you should write down basically everything they say. Because it's all useful information. Ideally, you should have like one big document with this information, right? Like you can group it by debate, you can group it by judge, but like you should have basically a big word doc where you're writing down what the judge is saying after every debate when they deliver their decision. This is important because you could refer back to this in the future, right? You, when you're debating in front of the same judge at the next tournament, you could refer back to what they said in the previous debate to understand what arguments they were, you know, they were vibing with, what arguments they found that they were receptive to, and what arguments they weren't. And maybe that doesn't matter, right? Maybe you're making a totally different argument, but it is still useful information, especially if you accumulate this over multiple years of debate. You know, I had a document, um, you know, I still have it, and I wonder, I'm gonna do this live, so we'll see how this goes, but how many times over the course of my debate career I debated in some of the same judge, like if I could control F their name, like how many times do they show up? I'm gonna max so they can't see this, that's annoying. Okay, I'm gonna guess like dozens, or at least like a dozen for some judges. And so over a dozen times in front of the judge, you're gonna accumulate useful information, and you're gonna get an impression of them, and you should be writing it down. Don't, but this, the, the caveat to this, the flip side of this, that is like really hard to sort of balance, is don't over apply advice. And this is a huge mistake I see, and this, is, this gets, gets back at the like, the judge hates me type reaction, which is like, the judge did, was not persuaded by your econ decide in a given debate. Does not mean you can never go for the econ decide in front of this judge, right? Recognizing that most advice is contingent upon the individual debate and like, is a result of how that individual debate went down. And so it gives you useful information about how the judge evaluated the arguments, but just because you went for the econ DA and lost, or just, went, just because you went for Afro pessimism and lost, doesn't mean you can't go for that argument in the next debate. It just means you have to go for that argument in the context of the previous comments they gave you, right? So there's some judges where like, I know there's a couple judges where it's like, they're just like total econ, like they, have, they don't know what a neutral straight is. And like, they'll admit this. That's fine. It means that your econ DA has to be simpler or more clearly explained the next time you do it, if they say they don't know what a neutral straight is, right? Um, being, the, maybe the best way to put this is being able to distinguish between general comments and specific ones. Right? So the judge will often give you very specific comments about a debate, and 
you should not take those as like the gospel truth for every time they evaluate a debate. They are contingent on that debate. But sometimes judges will say general things, right? Like I've seen judges in debates be like, look, you don't know what the court politics DA is? If I say court politics, like the plan causes a court, you know, causes the Supreme Court to like switch their decision on another case. I've heard a judge be like, look, I just don't understand or care about or want to vote for this argument. Like generally it is not persuasive to me. That's a general comment. You should take that as a general comment and avoid going for that argument in front of the judge in, in future debates. That is different from, I, was, I did not understand this argument in this debate or like explain it in a different way or something like that, right? So being able to distinguish between those general and those specific comments is really critical. Okay, uh, don't argue with your judge. This is a controversial take, but I've done this longer than you all have, so I promise you, you will not get anywhere if you argue with your judge. Have you ever given? Yes. How do you go? Not well. You'll never change a judge's vote, right? You'll, ne you'll, never, you'll never get them to change their decision. There's a fine line here. So when, th th there is a lot of like, there is a few things that like you can only do once you're good. And like it's totally possible that you all are already at that point. My guess is you're not. Um, at like, but what I mean by like once you're good is like once you're like a senior in college, if you're debating in college or whatever, right? Like so, there is there is to some degree a a value if you want to argue with like there's times when you should argue with the judge to like communicate to them. There is a signaling value to being argumentative, right? There is a perceptual value of like I think you were wrong about this. I'm going to take this into consideration, and given that you judge me a lot, you should recognize that we are not going to uh, back down on this issue, and the next time you judge us, take that into consideration. There is a signaling value to that. Don't argue with the judge, like, don't do that. <laughs> like, you can only do that once you've been judged by a judge a, a dozen times and know them well and are very good at debate, right? Winning a debate means convincing the judge to vote for you. If you did not convince the judge to vote for you, you did not win the debate, regardless of how good you think your argument is. So don't argue with the judge. You should ask questions, right? It is totally reasonable to ask questions. And if you want to ask questions that are a little pointed, that's fine. Like you can, you know, if you're frustrated, you can express your frustration through pointed questions. But those should be those should be asked in a calm and respectful manner. Because uh, those questions will get you useful information, right? Like this is another part of, of information gathering, is you can ask questions or you can email your judges later and ask questions. That's totally fine, yeah. How many questions is appropriate after um, to ask? Um, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. I would say once you get past like five, it's going on a little. Yeah. One thing I will say is that you should, if you're, this is like sort of sidebar, but worth knowing that the norm is generally, if you won the debate, let the other team ask questions. So like maybe you maybe know this, but like if you didn't know this, it, it is respectful to let the other team ask questions if you won the debate first. You can ask questions, but let them go. But yeah, if you, if you're just like grilling your judge for like twenty minutes, that doesn't come off that well. But yeah, questions are fine. Um, the upshot of all of this is that judges form impressions over the course of judging you and. The flip side to judges don't care about you is that if a judge judges you a dozen times, they will get to know you, and you will get to know them, and they will have an impression of you that shapes how they view your debating when you walk into the room at the beginning of the debate. If you make a particularly good impression in a series of debates, they will remember that, and the converse is also true. So this doesn't really happen from just one debate, right? Like this is never just like one debate to the next, but again, if you have someone where like they're on your circuit, they coach at the neighboring school or something, they're gonna be judging you constantly. This can give you a strategic advantage. It is in your interest to form these impressions well because you can sway the judge in close debates to want to vote for you if you've left a good impression. If you are known as someone who cares about debate, who researches well, who is engaged in their arguments and wants to be there, and that that's an impression the judge gets of you, that will help you in future debates in front of that judge. There have been debates that I think that I won because I knew what the judge liked. They've been judged by them before, I knew what arguments worked for them, and I knew that they liked me and respected me. And that matters if they don't have the same impression of the other team. Maybe they've never met the other team, or maybe they've formed a negative impression of the other team. That gives you a significant strategic advantage. So, a 
aside from just being like professional, respectful adults, it also helps you win tickets, which is like what we're all, what, I'm assuming you're all actually for. Uh, maybe not. All right, so that's multiple times in front of the same judge. Questions about that? Okay, you have eight minutes left. So I'm gonna give you time to get to your next question. Last thing I wanna talk about is judge philosophies. If y'all have y'all seen like you on Tabber and check the judge's name and you see their like paradigm or judge philosophy or whatever? Everyone familiar with this? Who's not familiar with this? Okay, cool. Um, judge philosophies are irrelevant. They are almost exactly the same in every case. They're almost always the same. They say the same things over and over again. Every judge philosophy says the same thing and it is almost never relevant. You can quickly skim them, and you should, but you should not over adapt. I would I argue that most people over adapt to judge philosophies. If I'm coaching, most of the questions I get from my debater in front of before the debate about the judge are like a function of thinking that the judge philosophy that they've written down is gospel truth and they have to follow it. It is not. It is a set of predispositions that can usually be easily changed, and it is the judge's own perception of how they judge, which they are not objective about. Right? Just as you're not objective about your own arguments, judges are not objective about how they judge debates, and so self-reporting about how they judge is not an objective metric. So judges often judge differently than they think they do. Your most effective tool for this is like skimming judge philosophies, but it'll be more useful for you to look back at your notes of previous debates in front of this judge, talk to your teammates who have been judged by them, talk to your friends, there is intelligence, intelligence that you can gather about judges that is not a function of their judge philosophy, and that will almost always be more productive than what they self-report in their judge philosophy. Um, most judges think about along similar lines. Most judges don't care about what your argument is, but rather how you make it. And so maybe this is the like central nugget here, which is that judge adaptation, adapting to a judge and debating in front of, in front of different judges, is a function of argument form, not argument content. It's not what argument you make, but it's how you make it. Meaning, are you doing the things that I outlined above, right? Are you acknowledging your opponent's arguments? Are you emphasizing the important ones? Are you making even if statements to allow the judge to resolve the debate? Those kinds of things are what judge adaptation should actually mean, not just this judge likes one to and not the other, so I can't go with another to say. That's almost never actually. The last caveat is that there are exceptions to this. So, some judges do actually hate certain arguments or love others. Uh, you can often figure that out from the judge philosophy, but it's often more useful from like the intelligence you gather or the, the, what you know about a judge long term. Um, you do have to make sure that they that you are distinguishing individual instances from a general pattern. So, like just because the judge voted against Afro-pessimism in one debate doesn't mean you can't go for Afro. You can, usually. Just because they voted against it in one debate does not mean anything broader. That being said, there are some judges who hate certain arguments. There are some judges against whom, against, you know, in front of, you cannot go for critiques. You just like can't, you'll lose. Uh, and it is your job to figure out who that is. That is only gonna be a product of your own debating and your own, and your own intelligence gathering. But those are edge cases, right? Those are exceptions rather than rules. That is basically what I've got. We have four minutes for questions. Do you think it's ever okay to like ask the judge for like clarification on something in their paradigm, or would you like? Is it better to not? I would. I would say it is okay. I would avoid it if you can. Okay. Um, I think it generally signals that you're reading too much into it. Okay. Um, like if you're if if something seems vague or unuseful, that's because it's not useful, and so you should just kind of ignore it. Okay. But but yeah, it would not be like you would not like lose details. Um, so like, like your entire repertoire of arguments. Yes. That is rare. Has that happened to you? Quite a bit. I was a year later, so. Okay. Um, I have thoughts on that. Um, Every judge does, yeah. <laughs> my basic thought is that you should not define yourself by a name of an author. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it, it is up to you in that case to be flexible enough to go for your argument in a way 
that persuades the judge, which often means going for your argument so it seems like a different argument to the defendant. Right? So if you're going for Baudrillard, but your judge is someone who's sort of middle of the road and like not interested in hyper reality, it might just mean going for your argument in a way that is functionally the security check. Okay. Right? Like even if it isn't actually, even if you're see, reading the same cards, but making your argument seem like something that they are more familiar with and more receptive to, even if it isn't actually that, okay. will go a long way. And like we can talk about more specifics if you want. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Like the timing of when the round ends. Mm. Um, That's a great question. So um, I would say try to be there a fair amount of the time. You certainly can leave to like go to the bathroom and get lunch or whatever. Like it is not a problem to like leave the room for moments. The general best practice is that one of the two partners should be there. So like if the if the if the turn is serving food, like have your partner go get food for both of you and have one of you sit in the room. Um, generally, having someone there is useful. Um, Especially, also, if the judge has like questions, like they want you to send them cards, but you're not there, then that's like a problem. So having one debater in the room is usually best practice, and both of you when you can be, but again, leaving for food, leaving for the bathroom, whatever, totally fine. Other questions? What do you think the like judge consensus is for like judging high school debates and high school debates like swearing in the future? Oh, that's a great question. Really cut down on the swear. Um, I think it is it is easy to overdo it. Like it's easier to overdo it than underdo it. I would say. Um, and this is true for college as well. Like this is not just high school debaters. Um, a well a well targeted and well deployed fuck is fine. Like you can you can swear in very specific instances. Um, it is. It is a, an intensifier, right? Like you can you can use swear words to intensify your arguments if you know how you're doing it and you do it very sparingly. But if you're dropping f bombs left and right, you're going to look like a nerd. <laughs> so I would really recommend cutting down and not not overdoing. Once or twice a day would be my would be my rule of thumb. It's like maybe once in your final. Also a great question. I did not talk about panels at all, but that would be something you face as well. Um, the first thing I would say is generally that is not as severe as you might imagine. Like it is usually the case that there will be some overlap between their argumentative preferences, just because most judges, their argumentative preferences are not that strong. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, sometimes you gotta go for the two one. Like this is a conversation you have to have before the debate. Like if you have two judges that you know are really receptive to your argument and one judge that you know hates it, like. A two one is a win, right? Like you get two judges out of three to vote for you and you've won the debate. So my general take on that is like, generally don't worry about it, but there are instances in which you have to assume you're gonna lose one of the two judges. Cool? All right, next elective.